Fish are hands down among the most diverse of all vertebrate life, and because of this diversity, have taken up practically any niche you think of in an aquatic environment. And to manage this, it figures that different species would evolve wide-ranging and varying body plans to do so, which is just what we see today and throughout time. This video will aim to cover as many as is reasonable and show the benefits and how they came about, and also about how some fish that look like total opposites are actually among their closest relatives. Starting off, the body shape and therefore the locomotory behaviour in fishes is determined extensively by the medium of water and the extreme density that they have to put up with. Being 50 times more viscous and 800 times more dense than air, locomotion through it is energetically expensive. You can experience this yourself when trying to run in a shallow pool as a more human and relatable example. To make their way through this medium, similar to the aerodynamics of flights, powered swimming requires fish to be able to overcome drag by producing thrust to propel them forwards being able to produce lifts to counteract gravity, as well as being able to minimise drags so that they can better pass through the water. To deal with this, fish have a wide range of anatomical features such as swim bladders, storing oils and lipids, as well as using the pectoral fins to create lift to maintain the positioning, though for the sake of this video I'll be focusing on one key aspect of how fish navigate their environments, and that's their locomotory style. Fish's mentions come in a wide variety of forms regarding their locomotion, and in this case, 12 main generalised types will be discussed each of which vary depending on the fish's flexibility and what fins are utilised. The first of which being anguilliform, which is so named for the group of animals that mostly employ it, being the eels, though some sharks and most fish larvae also employ it. When an animal like an eel swims, their entire body, which is flexible throughout its whole length, moves in a series of sinuous waves passing down the head and tail, doing so evenly. The undulatory body waves are created by contraction waves which alternate between the right and left axial musculature in the head, neck and core region with contraction waves during steady swimming passing down the body axis from the head to the tail, the resulting waves moving backwards along the body faster than the body moves forward. The speed of the wave creators remains constant as it passes down the body, and will always exceed the speed of forward movements generated by the fish, which is down to drag and the energy which is lost to relative forces that are not directed forward. While having among the greatest degree of manoeuvrability and range of motion in fish, they are comparatively slow because of their long bodies and their interior regions being involved in propulsion, the same segments that push back on the water, wasting energy by pushing laterally and creating drag since water pushes on the bent sections of the fish as they move. For the next method, the subcaringiform group, featuring animals like trouts and cod, has more of a focus in the rear or posterior end of the fish, with propulsive activity increasing towards the fish's tail, reducing drag and wave generation and allowing for increased speed but with generally less manoeuvrability as a compromise. Carrying this trend on and further focusing the propulsion of fish more towards their tail region is caringiform swimming, among the most typical form of what is seen and or visualised in fish like herring, and also trends with more fusiform body shape which further reduces drag and streamlines them in the process. One major aspect of this style of swimming is the existence of a hinge that connects the keel to the caudal peduncle, something which further reduces drag, allowing them to maintain their tails at an ideal angle of 10 to 20 degrees through much of their power stroke. This makes up for the constant angle changes as the tail swoops in anguilliform and subcaringiform swimmers, where said change produces less thrust at low angles and creates more drag at higher ones. Tuniform locomotion, named after the incredibly fast swimming tuna, is well, one of the most efficient of swimming forms and one that allows for the greatest long-term speed. Most prevalent in pelagic fish, tuniform swimming takes a posterior form of undulation to its extreme with thrust and virtually all of the sideways movements being generated in the tail and the region connecting the body to the tail, the previously mentioned caudal peduncle. Also found in lamnid sharks, the tail itself in these fish is often large and crescent shaped, another adaptation to reduce drag, something known as high aspect ratio tails, which also helps for sustained swimming, which will be got to. The efficiency of this form of swimming relies heavily on the tendons that run along the joints in the peduncle region of the tail, with these joints serving as pulleys that increase the pulling power of the muscle tendon network. This concentration of propulsion and rapid tail movements also allows for higher speeds, as well as cruising, which makes it all the more relevant in oceanic predators which need to reach prey quickly. This higher speed and capacity for sustained swimming is made further possible by the large masses of red muscle along their sides which, being rich in capillaries and blood flow, can perform aerobic oxidation without accumulating too much lactic acid, preventing muscle fatigue from building up. The location of the red muscle, which is close to their spines, also allows for their bodies to remain rigid, and also permits the retention of heat, which is generated by the movements, leading to endothermy, an internal generation of heat which furthers their energy levels and speed. Continuing on, the next form, being ostracoform, involves almost no oscillation, 
except for from their tail fins, while the rest of their bodies remain stiff, having to exert a lot of force to maintain their speeds. Often living near reefs, animals like boxfish and pufferfish, while swimming on gangly and inefficient, experiencing twice as much drag compared to most other fish, are well constructed for dealing with the water that flows past them or when encountering currents. The uneven surfaces and projections from the carapace, especially in boxfish, generate vortices, spiralling movements of water that end up counteracting the pitching and whining that results from water flow, and all without having to utilise their other fins or swim bladder. It is in fact this unhydrodynamic and unstable body plan that actually results in their stability and manoeuvrability, being able to make very quick turning movements which today have been replicated in both cars and in fighter jets, the latter of which need to be especially mobile when in the air and engaging with targets. The next swimming types rely instead mainly on their pectoral fins and not their body slash tails, these being the rajiform, diodontiform and labriform styles. Rajiform swimmers, including the skates and rays, move using the multiple undulations that are generated and pass backwards and or forwards along their pectoral fins, which in their case are very well developed and almost wing-like, allowing for great control when it comes to hovering and manoeuvring in the water column. Diodontiform locomotion, like seen in porcupine fish, is conducted similar to the rajiform style, only without the greatly enlarged fins, with labriform swimmers, including fish like the rasses and parrotfish, using the oscillatory movements of their pectoral fins in a rowing motion to generate lift. Oftentimes, following the main power stroke, their fins are all held firmly against the bodies to increase streamlining as they navigate their environments, having a tendency to keep them heading in a straight line. Because many of the species that use this method to navigate lack swim bladders and the buoyancy control it offers, it is a common sight to see these kinds of fish continually swimming, and because of this, are able to cover distances in great time as they continuously cruise around their predominantly reef like habitats in search of food. Focusing next on those that primarily utilise their dorsal and anal fins, this encompasses the final four locomotory styles that I'll be talking about, being the ammiform, gymnosiform, ballistiform and teratodontiform methods. Ammiform locomotion utilises undulations alongside a fish's dorsal fin, which can be seen in many varying fish species from bowfin to seahorses, in where they keep their bodies held straight and stable, with the rate at which they oscillate being quite rapid to keep up their momentum. Gymnosiform swimmers use their anal fins whereby undulations pass along, seen in fish like feather fins or knife fish, which is essentially just an upside down form of ammiform locomotion. Ballistiform swimmers like triggerfish undulate both their anal and dorsal fins for slow but effective locomotion, using their caudal fins for when they either need to escape predators or defend themselves from perceived ones, including people. The tetradontiform swimmers, seen most explicitly in the ocean sunfishes, flap their dorsal and anal fins synchronously with their narrow and pointed fins effectively functioning like wings to generate lifts and thrust continuously with oscillatory fin movements, a modification of the undulatory method employed by ballistiform swimmers, leading to quite strange forms in the process. With all of these forms, many fish will often switch swimming modes dependent on the species, and so not all fish fit neatly into just one of these categories. Results from other papers on fish locomotion have found that in some cases, in fact, that some modes of swimming between fish differ between the swimming patterns used to compute forces that don't actually match with how a range of fish swim, and so it has even been suggested that some of these descriptors of their locomotion should be reconsidered in spite of their entrenchment in the literature. Considering how varied fish are, and how animals as divergent in shape as tuna and seahorses are their own closest relatives compared to almost all other fish species, there is still much to be learned on them and how they navigate their intricate worlds. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time, whatever that may be.